Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to be at an international congress. Uh, I think that uh, this is actually a very important uh, event. I was delighted to see that the International Congress was formed several years ago. Uh, I think Anne-Marie and uh, Susanna did a wonderful job. It's uh, visionary. There was a similar organization that existed in the 1950s, from the 1940s to the 1960s. It was called the International Society of Naturopathic Physicians. And it was a critical society at that period of time in the political development of the professions internationally. And it had particular impact in the United States to assure the survival of the profession at the time. Uh, during a very deep, dark area in uh, naturopathic history in the United States. I'll be speaking today on scientific iris diagnosis uh, and its role uh, in uh, clinical practice. Naturopathic iris diagnosis, maybe you've heard it called iridodiagnosis, iridology, irido iris diagnosis, any number of different names. It's the uh, observation of the anterior segment of the iris and its implication in health, both prevention, evaluation, and treatment. It is a branch of the larger field of uh, eye diagnosis. Uh, I'll be speaking just directly to the iris today. Conventional medical practice uh, actually has uh, several signs that they look for in the iris. They're mostly end stage. They are not uh, preventative in any way. The Kaiser Flesher ring and Wellson's disease can help with the diagnosis. If it occurs, you can look for the yellow sclering ja and jaundice, the Argel Robertson pupil of syphilis. Um, but we have a slightly different approach in naturopathic medicine with iris diagnosis. Uh, it proposes that iris signs actually provide a biological anamnesis, a history, a biological history of the individual, risk factors, as well as the proxis or the theory and practice for both prevention and treatment. And I'm going to show you this is one of my most favorite uh, iris charts. This is Dr. Ferrandis. He is a uh, Barcelona medical doctor, a naturopathic doctor. Uh, he wrote a wonderful textbook in 1972. It's a beautiful leather bound in Catalan, completely opaque to my Spanish uh, reading capabilities. And this is his iris chart. Only something like this could be pro uh, provided by someone who uh, was from Barcelona, such a beautiful city. We'll see here much, actually, that I'll be talking about today, symbolically and iconog iconographically represented. I ask you, please, to look at this while I chat a little bit about uh, the topic today. You'll see the three basic iris colors, the dark brown to the left there, the light blue in the bottom, and the mixed biliary or the mixed uh, combination. You cannot see that. Uh, and you'll see that they're ordered, especially the blue on the bottom, from uh, clear translucent iris to uh, the uh, accumulations and tissue depositions and uh, disintegration that occurs across. You'll see the spinal cord prominently displayed, splayed open, the spinal ganglia, and the lines connecting the different topographical regions of the iris chart. And uh, <clears throat> it's a beautiful, please take a photograph of it in your mind. As I'm talking today, I'll be referring back to this. Dr. Ferrandis, uh, his name is Vincenzi Ferrandis, my son, Kai Vincent, is actually named after him. Uh, he was an important uh, individual in Spain for the development of the profession here. He actually graduated from Benedict List School through the Correspondence Course, which is a four-year course in the 1930s that was available through Correspondence. Unable to practice in Spain, he pursued his medical, doc de medical degree and practiced for many years and influenced the evolution. Uh, it's wonderful to be at the Congress, but particularly in Barcelona, it has had a very personal, uh, I have a very personal connection with Barcelona, uh, so it is wonderful to be here uh, today in particular. So, what are we looking at here with iris diagnosis? Well, we're going to be observing the structure, the color, the tissue integrity, biochemical accumulations, and vasomotor signs. And we're evaluating its implications, its risks. You'll see here that yellowing that uh, is at the top of the iris there. We're looking at risk stratification, diagnosis, and prognosis. You'll see at uh, about 35 minutes that small laguna or lacoon uh, that you see there, and you'll see the white fibers running away from it. And you'll also see uh, the yellow, and you'll see, do you see, if you look at the pupil at the center, at approximately 3 o'clock, you'll see a rippling that's occurring. That is actually desiccation and drying out of the lens that's visible, and it tells us something about what's happening with the body corporally. And it's that understanding of the microcosm and the macrocosm that is iris diagnosis. Uh, you'll see at the top, if you can see it's difficult, maybe they could turn the lights down for the better contrast, accumulation of lipids at the top of the iris there. Uh, over at the left, at approximately 20 minutes, there's actually a vascularized blood vessel. The fibers of the iris are blood vessels wrapped in connective tissue in a corkscrew fashion that allows the pupil to open and to close. This is a vascularized uh, uh, radical. Now, all of these signs can actually be put into three categories after Joseph Deck, structural signs, pigmentation signs, and reflex signs. 
I should take an aside and, moment and uh, indicate what my orientation is. I'm a clinician, I'm a physician. At my uh, clinic, I see around 8,000 patients a year. I treat everything from cancer to pregnant women to uh, children to diabetes, really across the board. Uh, and uh, so I am a clinician first and foremost. So this will be practical clinical advice, I hope, embedded within the research paradigm. Can I ask who uses iris diagnosis in clinical practice here? Wonderful, it's good to see. Who uh, thinks that iris diagnosis is total nonsense? Is there anybody here who thinks that or is bold enough to raise their hands? I'll raise my hand. 25 years ago, when I first heard of this, I said that sounds like total nonsense. And here I am today to discuss the scientific underpinnings. There is so much truth and value that even if you do not use this clinically, please pay attention because there are great insights that iris diagnosis can, uh, can supply for clinical practice. Structural pigmentation and reflex signs, that corresponds to the physical, chemical, and neurological categories of disease-causing agents. If you're familiar with applied kinesiology, they have adopted that. The tripartite structure is actually a naturopathic concept from the revolution in medical practice by Dr. Bloomer in 1918. There are physical, chemical, and neurological stressors in life, and virtually all disease-causing agents can be put into there, and it is reflected in the iris as well. So if I will just take a moment here, Von Pesley, he was a revolutionary in prison during the revolutionary period of Europe who observed iris changes. Pastor Felke uh, was influenced by him. He trained lay people, including Madaus. Madaus and her daughter Eva Flink trained Kriega, who is a very important. And uh, if you're from Australia, have you ever read Kriega's work in iris diagnosis? It was a textbook and a handbook during the 60s and the 70s for teaching uh, scientific iris diagnosis, which brings us to the two figureheads, Joseph Deck on the left and Joseph Unger on the right, uh, who together the Felke Institute, uh, and my talk will conform with the categories of the Felke Institute in terms of how we discuss scientific iris diagnosis and their modern uh, chart. You'll see here, the, we owe a great debt, I believe, to the Germans for their uh, detail and for their precision in the evolution of scientific iris diagnosis. You'll see these early charts and how they attempted to identify the harmonic relationships and to do so in a mathematical model. We're going to look uh, first at the map itself. The first concept we'll look at is the, the, the concept that the body is somehow identified uh, iconographically on the iris. This is a uh, typical of uh, Latin uh, descriptions of the iris chart. You'll see the drawing there uh, around the stomach and intestinal center. You'll see the face to the center, uh, medial side, nasal side, uh, and you'll see the lungs out to the periphery there, etc. This is a fundamental naturopathic concept. Is there any evidence that it exists? Absolutely there is. And first we'll talk about Josef Deck's critical work. Uh, he started in the 1950s working with uh, Dr. Franz uh, Vida. Uh, Josef Deck was a naturopath uh, from Germany who committed his life's work really to the scientific evolution of the practice. Uh, initially they began the project, they looked at respiratory conditions and they found a 90% relevance, that's the term I will use, relevance of iris signs. They then looked at stomach and duodenal ulcers, 83.6% of the cases had relevant signs cartographically, and they did a larger 640 person inpatient hospital setting, uh, evaluation, full hospital workup, iris photography evaluation, et cetera. Overall, there's a 75%, 74.4% average as to clinical signs and relevancy. Well, you might think, gosh, we're going downhill here from 90 to 83 to 74. That's not at all what's happening. Uh, if you look at the different types of diseases and understand the horizontal nature of iris diagnosis, you will understand why some conditions arise or are visible in the iris and others are not. For example, TB, 85% of the cases, duodenal ulcer, again, around 80%, pyelitis, 100% of the time, mitral valve stenosis, 56% of the time. It varies upon what is going on in the body as to whether it will be reflected in the iris, whether preventative medicine can be in, uh, inferred from the iris, et cetera. And that's what the study found. So clinical proof and organ, uh, of organ and disease signs in the iris from 1950 to 1954. It's only published in German. It's a beautiful textbook. Uh, three conclusions that are of significance today. Organ topographic markings do occur in disease. That is to say the iris chart, cartography is relevant. Iris markings occur in disease, and iris markings can appear in advance of disease. They have predictive value. 
Why would this be? What is this magic? Not at all. This is a picture of the brain and the homunculus. There's a homunculus on the eye. Why would that happen? Well, 22 days after fertilization, 22 days after fertilization, inflations on either side of the developing brain uh, de uh, extend, and these are the beginnings of the eye. From the neural tube, they go out. So these neurological connections apparently, to some extent, remain. And that is why we see the homunculus on the eye. So let's go back to our iris here and our three categories. So this is a case for my practice. How does iris diagnosis work practically? Well, this individual came in. He's 59 years old, a heavy lifetime smoker. He has an elevated prostate-specific antigen of 9.0. Previously, a year ago, it was 3.0. Biopsy was advised by the, um, by the uh, urologist. He had seen some other naturopaths. Uh, and uh, he didn't know what to do, he came to me for a consult. So I did our complete workup, which does include iris diagnosis and all of our new patients, and I used the microscope and I looked under his eye. And you'll see at 35 minutes that uh, lacuna that I've expanded with the adjacent white fibers that are, that are swollen above the relief map. And you'll see that I've also uh, brought to the fore this swollen blood vessel in the uh, lower right corner there that is the spleen region. At the location at 35 minutes is the prostate region. So, understanding iris diagnosis, that this is a weakened organ disposition, a weakened organ system likely to cause disease, I see signs for inflammation, and I see splenic congestion. That suggests to me that we have an infectious sign. I reflect this to the patient. The patient responds to me after seeing several other doctors. Well, to tell you the truth, we haven't told anybody this. Right before this happened, the reason we went and got tested is after his ejaculate became a foul odor and was very yellow. So he had had an infection. He had not disposed this to anybody. We treated according to that what the iris found, what we now found out from the history, and we treated in particular using naturopathic physiotherapy, which is a specialty of mine. Uh, we call it biothermal therapy. Uh, and it lowered, and he's been stable now for two years. So it's a useful tool clinically and practically. So. Another finding from the study, the evaluation of stomach and intestinal illness represents a grateful area to iris diagnosis. Immediately around the pupil is the adjacent stomach, and then just out from that inside the collarette is what we call the uh, intestinal zone. And yes, they found that. So looking at a case here, um, this is a brown or hematogenic iris. This is the left iris. You'll know that because the pupil is slightly off-centered uh, towards your left. So that means this is their person's left iris. Look, uh, if you will, at uh, that is the, do you see the, uh, let me go back there. Do you see the slightly white uh, at uh, 20 uh, minutes to around 30 minutes around the edge of the collarette? I will step away. Let me get me right around there. I will expand that. This is an individual with ulcerative colitis, and these are reflex signs swelling in the local region. He had been, uh, I'll get into his case in a little bit, and then the right iris at uh, 35 minutes, that's the appendix area, and you'll see also swelling that's there. So, this is a, a case of mine. Uh, he had, um, had, he had been, uh, I don't have the whole case up there, but uh, he had been for six months in a chronic, uh, medic un unresponsive to medication ulcerative colitis flare. When I evaluated the iris, I saw that there was a component of the appendix that was also uh, at issue, so we treated that locally, again, using physiotherapy and other standard naturopathic or common naturopathic uh, approaches, and within six weeks we were able to get his ulcerative colitis into remission. Uh, I do not yet have follow-up photos to see that that swollen blood vessel then diminishes. That occurs over time. Are you with me? Good. So, <clears throat> the German medical community was very excited about this research in the 1950s, and they took it with open arms. Of course not, they did not. So they came back with a study by Dr. Kibler, has iris diagnosis any meaning? And what Dr. Kibler did is he took black and white photographs and he enlarged them and put the iris uh, map on top and said, are there markings here? So I guess he thought that when you take a photo and you enlarge it, it's like James Bond and suddenly you change your focal length and you can just find new information. You cannot. You cannot do that with a photograph. And what he found was that, yes, iris signs do occur in disease. They also occur in healthy normals, so there must be nothing to it. And they don't occur with measles or other viral infections, so there must be nothing to it. Well, perhaps he should have consulted some iris diagnosticians. So if we look at this iris here, and we just blow up that splenic sector, it looks very different than if we actually microscopically evaluate the area. It gives us different information. So you must know what you're doing with iris diagnosis. Now, let's look at it in black and white. Is there any difference there than color? Absolutely, there's much more information that's there. 
And let's look at this in black and white. There's almost nothing to see. You do not see that transversal segment running across that lower, that uh, whole field. But here, you can almost see it in black and white. And then when you put the color in, you see the blood coursing through that swollen blood vessel, that reflex neurologically mediated indicator from the body back uh, to the iris. So Professor Vouillard, who is also part of the study, uh, this is in the 1950s, there are still, unfortunately still, so-called scientists who will not allow themselves to be convinced these are beyond help. But for the real scientists who kept an open mind also for those problems which at first seemed inaccessible, this book is intended to show that iris diagnosis has its value, a greater one perhaps than we ourselves first believed. So Deck and Vita, they responded to this study uh, with a study of the renal sector. And uh, if there's any way to lower the lights up here, I don't know. But if you can look at 30 minutes, do you see a darkening that's occurring from the center out to the periphery there of the iris? That is the renal sector. And they looked at the renal sector in 72 cases of proven renal disease, and they found organ markings in 92% of the cases. They then looked at some school children, 135 healthy ones, and they found it, renal markings in 16% of the cases. However, a significant amount of those cases had had infections or conditions that do sometimes result in, in uh, nephro uh, nephrological or uh, nephrotoxic uh, conditions. So they may have had injury. But, so they looked at that sector there, and that was their response. 92% of the time it's there in proven renal cases, and it is not there in healthy children. So in an interview, uh, Iris, uh, Professor Volhard also said, uh, iris diagnosis is very difficult to learn, and I am convinced that the reason why many investigators who concern themselves with the iris uh, ended up with a negative finding are due to insufficient training. So this is a patient of mine. Um, this is her first iris photo there in 2011. That is, it's a different uh, mechanism, different device. That's all that's different there. That's 2013, and that's 2016. Did you see the changes that occurred there? So this is a 56-year-old female. Uh, she presented after her second renal transplant. She has her father's kidney. Uh, her GFR is between 20 and 30. She has recurrent upper respiratory infections, severe warts covering her hands, cold sores. She's fatigued, digestive problems. She feels terrible. Uh, so she's been under my care for about five years. Um, we've gotten her GFR to run around 35 to 40 at this point. It peaked at 48, actually. We got up to 48 at one point. Uh, other disorders uh, resolved except for her warts, and she was doing very well. And then in 2014 to 2015, she had a very difficult year with upper respiratory infections. And note the changes that occur from the upper left hand at uh, approximately 2 to 4 o'clock. You'll see a darkening that occurs, and then a significant darkening, not only at 2 to 4 o'clock, but almost down to 6 o'clock through the splenic zone. Now, you must remember she is a renal transplant patient on significant immunosuppressive medications. She was having severe upper respiratory infections. Uh, finally, the uh, nephrologist, who works very well with us, he encourages her to continue whatever you're doing. I don't understand it. Just do it. Uh, he lowered her organ rejection drugs, and immediately the respiratory infections stopped. They have done some damage, but she is alive, and she feels wonderful, and she's very grateful. So, and her warts, which covered her hands, cleared uh, within a month. So uh, do you see the changes that are there? in the iris, that the iris does change. In some cases, you'll see the, the desiccation of the tissue itself that occurs there. Yes. So uh, this is from 1952. This is the basic textbook of naturopathic iris diagnosis uh, written by the profession at the time. is designed as a fundamental teaching tool. This is the first page. And you'll see the four different types. It's, look at the photography. Isn't it amazing? Uh, it's very limited. And the technology is finally caught up to allow iris diagnosis to develop. What they're laying out there is the second concept we'll look at, which is the basic integrity of the individual, or the tissue integrity, can be determined uh, and graded according to the quality of the tissue itself. So from the clear, translucent iris with uh, very little accumulation uh, up to secondary changes, breaking down of the tissue, and finally a complete mishmash. Now, this is not one iris turning into another. That is not how it occurs. These are genetic predispositions. These are how these individuals make their connective tissue. And so, again, at the bottom of the chart here of Dr. Ferrandis, you can see what is represented. Does everybody see that there? How we're representing the grading of the iris and what I'm referring to? Yes? Yes. 
So does this exist? Well, in 1971 in uh, Russia, they, they did a study on 2,000 patients, half men, half women roughly, those that have pre-existing diagnoses and those that don't know pre-existing diagnosis, and they categorized them into five groups, four, five, or six groups. They categorized them to the quality, clarity of the iris. And what they found was that types one and two were most common in healthy types. Type three were found in both healthy and ill, and type four and five, those that had accumulations and significant tissue breakdown, had multiple diagnoses. Clarity, uniformity of color, and transparency, and uniform density all correspond to healthy populations. You can look at the iris and understand their risk factor immediately by looking at that as to whether or not they will be healthier or not than other individuals. Their resistive capacity. So this is a case, you'll see, uh, very fine fibers packed together, 80 years old, lives alone. She has some hypertension and some arthritis. She still works. This here, you'll see that uh, we have uh, tissue uh, folding from spasm. You'll see a lacuna at 25 minutes adjacent to the wreath with a pigment that's there. 30-year-old male, low testosterone, irritable bowel syndrome. He has an inguinal hernia that I'm treating with injections. Fatigue, hypothyroidism. He's 30 years old. Now you'll see... This individual, he has an open, uh, loose uh, connective tissue disposition there. Uh, he's a 57-year-old male with severe arthritis. He's obese, chronic atrial fibrillation, IBS, arthritis, recurrent joint laxity. And then you'll see here this iris of a young man who's 23 years old, and he has acute lymphoblastic leukemia. If you've studied Krieg, you'll see that one of the uh, references is to the pinpoint breaking down of the lymphatic system visible by all of the holes through the air. This is what he's describing. And this is a young man with a leukemia. So what else did they look at? You look here at the upper right-hand corner there, that pigment patch at 45 minutes adjacent to the pupil. We're looking at pigment patches. And they found that pigment patches aggregate over time, that they accumulate. Younger individuals have less, older individuals have more. It is melanin deposition that's occurring in the iris tissue itself. And they confirmed that pigment patches localize in disease unilaterally according to the chart map. They also looked at um, that why they occur, and they occur more frequently where there's a neurological reflex associated with pain in the region. It does not occur with organ removal. So they confirmed the basic textural analysis of iridology, the clarity of uh, pigmentation corresponds to likelihood of diagnosis, and they confirmed that the, uh, the, uh, there's a neurological reflex most likely signaling pigment formation. It may be an adaptive mechanism by the body to protect it from UV light to protect the organ so it can rest in the shade, so to speak. This is a case for my practice, 45 minutes. You'll see a defect sign with a, surrounded by pigmentation, 68 years old, highly stressed, recurrent atopic disease, severe diarrheal IBS, menopausal symptoms, proctitis. We treated her, we resolved those. Looking at her iris in the esophageal zone, this is the left iris at 45 minutes, there's a significant pigment with a defect sign. That's an inherited cancer risk. On inquiry, it turns out that her father had esophageal cancer killed him. Her son, who's young, has severe intractable reflex that is not responsive to any medication. I'm still trying to get him in the office so that I can treat him and see it. But it's the iris that allowed me on inquiry to understand the family's genetic risk factors. MRI and blood tests cannot do that. So certain iris signs have predictive value, that is our next, and can alert the doctor to silent disease processes here in Spain. Uh, they did uh, iris sectoral assessment of the pulmonary system, pulmonary exam, and then they did imaging. And they looked at uh, 340 healthy volunteers, 211 who had iris signs. Kibler's complaint. They occur in healthy normals. They cannot be real. So they took these healthy normals who had the ir uh, iris sign, and then they looked, and they found that 80% of them on further confirmation had, on further workup, confirmation of the iris sign. It can alert us to predispositions. So... <clears throat> They concluded that it's hard to look at brown eyes and to evaluate them. This is true. The presence of permanent iris signs, such as lacuna, permanent iris signs indicate a preclinical state. They are disposition. And this year in the lung sector, we see a, an impression lacuna in a patient, hypertension, leg swelling, et cetera, and severe asthma. This is an individual you'll see there, that opening here. This is the left iris at about 20 minutes, that opening that's there. Severe asthma. She was in the hospital with... Uh, uh, with, uh, and this is it uh, four, uh, two years uh, later. This looks like a change in the iris. This is not. Look at the pupil. You'll notice that it is much smaller. 
the iris is of accordion. So it looks like changes. They're actually not in this case. She's stable now. Uh, she almost died several times from her asthma. Here we see, uh, not under my care, that's previous to coming to my care. <laughs> Uh, in a study of 97 individuals, uh, we're looking at uh, the pancreas sector of the right iris. Do you see the, the lacuna that is there? Thank you. The lacuna that is there, um, the, that is a risk factor for diabetes, 98% in a study of 100 individuals, 98% of diabetics had that sign. Um, this is a 64-year-old male with uh, diabetes. Uh, and then this is a 70-year-old, uh, 68-year-old uh, man with chronic hep C. He also has diabetes, and he has, you almost can see it here, defect signs in the liver zone. He has a primary hepatoma. Uh, he's been under treatment uh, for several years, and it's stable um, at this time. So this is a study on uh, genetic type and iris disposition. The tight fibers packed closely together we call the neurogenic. It is associated with the gene associated with hypertension. We are looking at genetic risk factors when we look at the eye. Now, you'll notice this is that healthy woman. There is actually a tumor fork, that trident shape pointing to a pigment there, uh, immediately at the bottom, and that is a, a risk factor for cancer. She did develop uterine cancer nine years ago. She was treated with surgical removal, biological aftercare naturopathically, and she just walked out of that like nothing happened. Iris diagnosis does not uh, find out uh, serum values of creatinine. It does not identify gallstones. Research in the British Medical Journal and JAMA confirmed that. We wouldn't expect it. Thank you for telling us our limitations. The eye does not determine gallstones. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Vander. Uh, he is a Barcelona doctor. He came. He was trained. This is uh, Dr. Asheron looking at the iris, and uh, he was in uh, South, South, South America. The inflammatory process in the digestive tract uh, was what he treated. Why do we look at the iris? Well, the father of naturopathic pathology looked at uh, accumulations in the body of tissues, uh, the unity of disease, all disease uh, naturopathically is an accumulation of biological waste products improperly eliminated with genetic risk and traumatism. Dr. Vander trained there, came to Barcelona, again was unable to practice, so he became an author, and he wrote a wonderful textbook on natural medicine that I bought last time I was in Barcelona at a tiny little bookshop, and he also wrote a textbook on iris diagnosis and he helped uh, the association FANACO to form. Ferrandis did a study on uh, the iris and migraines, and the last concept is that iris diagnosis provides a therapeutic ordering. He looked at 200 cases of migraines. The most common signs were nerve rings and constipation, and he treated to resolve constipation and restore the nervous system. This is a, a patient of mine. You'll see the rings circling. Those are cramp rings. Those are what he saw, and you'll see a tight autonomic nerve wreath immediately around. It's almost to the pupil. That is the constipation sign. This is a patient of mine, uh, 31 years old. She had pseudotumor cerebri that's swelling on the brain. Uh, it looks like a tumor, but it's not. Uh, she had innumerable pulmonary emboli, chronically constipated, chronic low back pain, recurrent migraines, and pressure on the optic nerve. All conditions res resolved in about a year. There's a weakness sign at the base of the brain. I treated her mechanically to improve drainage of the fluids out of the uh, cerebrum. That helped to resolve that. You'll see at 11 o'clock a darkening at the area for the eye. That is chronic pressure on the optic nerve, reflex irritation causing it. That will never go away. That is there. Her eye vision is fine now. We resolve that. Uh, and you'll see the, the tiny little defect markings in the lung zone. Uh, we resolved all the emboli. She's left with uh, four silicosis markers. She goes to Burning Man, which is an event that's out in the desert, and she has chronic silicosis probably from that. They want to study her. She's a veteran of the United States Army. They want to study her because she got better, and they've never seen somebody like that get better. Um, they didn't do anything for her. That's what naturopathy does. This is her father. Uh, do you see a similarity in the iris? That's her father, 54 years old, chronic headaches, unresponsive to medication since 10 years old, nothing is working, daily, several times a week, they're very severe, uh, and you'll see that same marking, the cramp rings. You'll see this very tight uh, autonomic nerve wreath around the pupil. That is the inherited disposition. Uh, within four months, we cleared his headaches, and they have not returned after a year. Naturopathic treatment dictated, based on what I understood from the iris, how to treat this individual biologically and holistically. That is what iris diagnosis does. It is our own unique paradigm of diagnosis. I encourage all of us to study, understand, and appreciate it uh, as best we can. So the iridological, these are my last two slides, paradigm of health and disease. There's a genetic type, a 
constitution. There is an organ disposition which can be affected in disease states, and there are environmental exposures which will activate the genetics and those dispositions, leading to physiological dysfunction. That is what causes disease. This is the paradigm of functional medicine that they are coming to under uh, Jeffrey Bland. It is the paradigm of naturopathic medicine understood through iridology for over a century. I encourage those who do not use this to explore this topic or to refer to those who do. So finally, in summation, naturopathic iris diagnosis is science unique to our profession. It is useful for both prevention and treatment. The topographic markings are relevant. Iris markings do occur in disease. They can appear in advance of disease. The basic texture of the iris can be graded in view of organic resistance to disease processes, the so-called vitality. You can determine that by looking very quickly at the iris. They have predictive value for predisposition. It does not replace imaging or laboratory evaluation. I use that extensively as a physician in uh, the United States. I order innumerable tests uh, to help me understand. Iris diagnosis provides clues to the therapeutic paradigm and shapes intervention. And the research and practice must take into account both possibility and limitation of the science, a strong knowledge of the literature, and coupled with very practical experience. Thank you so much for having me. These are my contacts. Thank you.